Good morning, good morning. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for this time, this opportunity to uh, study your word. And thank you, Lord, so much that we have this, we have the Bible to be able to study and to find out about you and to learn more and more about you. Thank you so much for this beautiful gift of getting to know you and the beautiful gift of salvation, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay. Chapter 20. I'll probably get the whole chapter today. Uh, not that long. 29 verses. So, uh, comes a couple of different things in here. So I, cut, I named it the years of wandering end with Aaron's death. death. So we got two deaths during this chapter. Miriam's and Aaron's. So we're starting to see the, uh, the end of the... Uh, the older generation that had to die off in order to enter the promised land, all because of that situation back in uh, what was it, chapter oh, 14 or 15 or so that uh, they turned away the spies, the spies uh, got scared of some giants and they didn't trust the Lord so that uh, the Lord had to punish them for that. So they've been wandering around in the desert. So this ends that 40 years of wandering and uh, that, so kind of all during this chapter, uh, pretty much that happens. Uh, so, well, actually about 18 years of it happens during this chapter. But it's the end of the 40-year wandering. So let's uh, take a look at this. So i got a map up here. I know it doesn't look like a map yet, does it? Now it looks like a map. And right now we've been hanging out around here, down at Kadesh uh, Barnea. And... Uh, so we're going to be uh, got another map that actually shows the uh, the route they're going to be taking during this chapter, and so uh, kind of flip flop between these two because of uh, different reasons. Because it talks about this thing called the King's Highway, and this is the King's Highway here, goes up through Jordan, mostly uh, Basra, Petra, that area. And it's a well-known uh, trade route. And uh, and Moses is going to request to be able to to use that road. And he's going to get denied by the uh, by the uh, Edomites. So that's why I'm uh, showing you this map here. And you can see where the Edomites is and where this road is. So I'll still leave it there for a moment. So we move, to the, we move from the point of wandering and begin to see the older generation begin to die off. Miriam, Miriam Moses' sister, being noted here in Scripture. This was very odd also, as very few women got the privilege of recording their uh, deaths in the Bible. Uh, their brother Aaron was soon followed by the end of the chapter. We'll jump from uh, about 1471 B.C. to about 1452 B.C. during this chapter. For a total of 40 years since the bad report of the of the uh, spies. So let's kick off here in verse 1. And the, the children, uh, then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried dead. So there's, there's, there's Kadesh right there. And... I don't know if, it, uh, if I had a map that showed uh, this one actually showed the. Uh, no, don't. I had another one. I saw that it was going to bring up, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. It actually showed those two wildernesses. But it's also known as the, wilderness, uh, the desert of Zdin in this general area down here. So Miriam watched Moses at the bay. Uh, so. Uh, so Miriam died there. So, so Miriam, uh, Miriam, we got first introduced uh, when we when uh, Miriam watched Moses actually as a baby go down the river, and kind of do a little quick little history of uh, Miriam here, going back to Exodus chapter two. And when she could no longer hide him, she took from this is, this is Moses' mother. She took from him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch. Put the child therein, and she laid it in the in the flags by the riverbank. And her sister 
his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. That sister is Miriam. He only had one sister. And then jumping down to verse 7, Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go, and the maid went and called the child's mother. So, then jump into verse, the chapter Exodus 15, verses 20. Continuing with a little quick history lesson of Miriam. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. So we can see she's prominent uh, in this whole particular period of time of the Exodus. Then we see her again in Numbers 2659 with the famous uh this just describes uh, and the name of Aram's wife was Jobed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt. And she bare unto Amron, Aaron, and Moses, and Miriam, their sister. So it kind of ties the three people together. So at this point, being probably at least 10 years older than Moses, because uh, she had, because he was a baby when she was actually following him down the riverbank, died uh, approximately 110 years old. Uh, I'm guessing uh, Mo Moses is about 100 years old here. So a good long life. I wouldn't say she died early by any stretch of the imagination. So you got to say to yourself, why did, why was Miriam even mentioned uh, on her death? And like I said, I'm kind of uh, in a way of honoring her. But just like anyone, they had they fall into they they've had a uh, rough life and they've done, they've made mistakes in their lives. So remember, Moses spent 40 years as the son of Pharaoh, 40 years in Midian, and now some 20 years since the time they left Egypt. So Moses is approximately 100 at this point. We also remember the incident uh, with upsetting God, and she learned quickly not to judge what God has blessed. I remember that famous uh, thing that happened with the leprosy and Miriam. That's in Numbers 12, 5 through uh, 10. And it goes through the whole chapter, but I'll just read the first five verses here to refresh our memory. And the Lord came down in a pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle, called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said unto her, and he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches and a similitude of the Lord shall be beheld. Therefore, th then, were, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? This is God speaking to Aaron and and, uh, and Miriam. This is going to be important because uh, this is what causes them, the, those two not to be able to go into the promised land. Verse 9 of Numbers 12. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And a cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and beheld Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. That part there in the last was that the, the, only the high priest could could pronounce somebody as having leprosy. So that just confirms him as the high priest. I confirmed that. So that was it. that was that incident there. And you can read the rest of it. You want to go back to chapter 12 and read the rest of the story. Miriam does live, and uh, they wait for her to get over the leprosy. She has, she has it for seven days. So now to continue here, that was that was it on Miriam. So now we're going to move into a situation where the people needed water. And this is where Moses makes his mistake, and not, and why he's not going to go into the promised land. So I'm going to read verses 2 through 8, and then we'll talk about a couple of things. And there was no water from the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and, <coughs> and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? Wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in, in unto this evil place? Is there no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates? Neither is there any water to drink. 
And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thy rod, and gather thy the assembly together, thou and Aaron, thy brother. Speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall be given forth his, uh, his water. And it shall give forth his water. Interesting term there. And they shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation, and their beasts drink. Now, God was not mad at them at this point. He knows they needed water. But him, uh, it seems like uh, Moses is getting a little frustrated. So Moses, uh, not listening and not paying attention to what God said, he said, speak unto them before their eyes. So we are in a transition here. It seems the wandering pot is complete. But again, uh, but again, the people are in need, and this time a rather interesting judgment is placed on Moses. Here God was not necessarily upset and wanted Moses to speak to the rock, not to strike it. I just want to look at a couple of the passages talking about this. In Nehemiah 9, 15 through 17. And gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger, and bring us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promised them that they should go and possess the land which they had, they had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hardened not to thy commandments and refused to obey, neither were, were mindful of the wanderings that they among them, but hardened their necks and their rebellion appointed a captain to return to the bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness and forsake them not. So you see here, God, even though, even though they turned against God uh, left and right, God still, still took care of them. Also, Psalms 78, 15, and 16. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Well, just confirming that what we're seeing here is that it actually did happen. We have, we have the witnesses of other, other prophets and in, uh, in, uh, people. And also, uh, Psalm 105, 41. He opened the rock and the waters gushed out. They ran into dry places like a river. And Schofield uh, comments on it this way. Speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Unlike the first time, which he was supposed told to strike it, that was in Exodus 17, 5 and 6. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of the Israel and thy rod wherewith thy smoke smokes the river. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and thou shalt come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, the reason that, and this is where we get into this correlation, we, all, we know that Jesus is always referred to as the rock. So you can see we got two rocks here. We got the first rock is smited, the second rock is spoken to. Well, that's why Moses broke the pattern, and that's why God's upset with him. He won't let him into the promised land, because he broke the pattern. Christ came the first time as a rock to die for it, was smite, was smite for, our, for our affliction, remember. But the second time he comes is to, is to receive us unto himself. So you can see the pattern here, and how Moses had upset that pattern. So that's why God is going to uh, have to do something about it. So the rock is Christ. And 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it mentions this. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So once smitten, needs not to be smitten, crucified again. He only had to be crucified once. Moses acted, Moses' act exalted himself. In Numbers 20, verse 10, let me read it again. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And implied in type that the one sacrifice was ineffectual, thus denying the eternal infancy of the blood. Some other places that references in Hebrews 9, 25 and 26. Nor yet that he should offer himself once, himself often, as the high priest entereth in the holy place every year with the blood of others, 
For then must he have often had suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jumping to verse 10 of, of Hebrews, verse 3, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Jump into verse 11 and 12. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice of sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. That was Jesus Christ, of course. So the abundant water, grace reaching the needs of the people, despite the error of their leader, tells a refreshing and powerful uh, power through the Spirit. Remember, Jesus also used the term uh, that I'll that give you living waters. Remember, to the woman at the well. Okay, moving back to Numbers 20, verses uh, 9 through 13. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must, you, must we fret you water out of this rock? So you can see here, this sounds like he's angry. And God was not angry at this time. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to satisfy, Sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given thee, given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Meribah means strife. And another place we see this reference is in Exodus, uh, Exodus 17, 7. So the people were in strife, and so they deserved, they, the water was a, was a blessing to them. And he called the name of the place Messiah and Meribah because of the childing of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So Meribah means strife. And so the strife of the people, is that, uh, so the living water of Jesus Christ is going to satisfy them. That's what the idea is behind that. This, the speaking to the second rock. So Jesus doesn't have to die more than once. And uh, that's the pattern. Okay, moving into verses 14 through 22. Now let's talk about Edom. This is the area down over here. That's where Bosnia is, or uh, Petra. I've shown you many, uh, I've shown you the, those pictures many times. Uh, maybe at some point during our study here, we'll actually bring them up again. But uh, Petra is that that uh, place where uh, has a, it's all the cliff areas. And it's where the the children of Israel during the tribulation at the midpoint are going to escape to. So verses, numbers, verses 14 through 22. I'll just read through them first. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith the bro thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. How our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the utmost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through the country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. So again, Kadesh is right here. This is the king's highway. So they want to cross over to the king's highway to be able to come up here into the promised land. That's the idea. This is what gets Edom in trouble and the Moabites uh, permanently, which I didn't believe in myself until I actually studied this for a bit. So let me continue here. Uh, Verse 18 of Numbers 20. And Edom said unto them, Thou shalt not pass by me, at least I come out against thee with the sword. So they're threatening that, uh, no, don't come across us. Let's do a little quick refresher. You remember who Edom is, the Edomites? That would be the brother of Jacob. Jacob being the uh, 
father of the 12 tri tribes of Israel, his brother, uh, he, uh, I'll tell you his name here in a second. Boy, I can't think of it all of a sudden. I see my notes. I know we're going to get to it. Esau, Esau. I'm sorry. <laughs> Give me a second to remember. His brother Esau is the is the founder of the Edomites. Remember the uh, the whole thing with the uh, with the blessing and how Jacob had to escape uh, from his brother uh, and uh, and hide up in uh, he went up into uh, his uncle's place and, mar and uh, married uh, Leah and then uh, finally got to Rebecca and that whole story there. So Edom. Uh, Again, that that oh, that old age old rivalry between the two brothers, the two twins, uh, continues to this day. So continuing verse twenty, and he oh, did I read verse nineteen? I don't think I did. And the children of Israel said to them, "We will go by the highway, and if I and the and my cattle drink by, of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet." And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. And the Edom refused to give Israel a passage through the border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. Okay, so the basic path is they had to avoid going into Edom. So they basically went like, like along like this. Which this other map shows it quite clearly. Up Kadesh Barnea, and they went over to Mount Hor. And that's where they are right now. That's where we're going to be talking about. So Edom's uh, so, Edom. so Edom's never forgotten sin of Jacob's brother. Uh, to remember this all the way back in Genesis. A few verses here just to reflect, refresh our memories. This is when the first, the, the first war between Jacob and Esau happened. It's in Genesis 25, 30 through 34. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with thy same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. That's how he got his name, because of his porridge that he asked of his brother. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, "Swear to me this day that he, that he swear unto him, and he shall." And he sold his birthright unto Jacob for a little bit of food. That's how much he cares about his birthright. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The oldest uh, Esau was the oldest, and because of being the oldest, he had he had certain rights as the oldest. And he was given up that birthright. Uh, but it's actually foretold that Jacob was actually going to uh, rule over his brother uh, Esau. The youngest will rule over the oldest. So that, uh, this is fulfilling prophecy. But Jacob is still the one that uh, uh, ended up getting the birthright. But Esau is still mad about it. And it, and it filtered all the way down into his people. So as people, kind of like the uh, Hatfields and McCoys, probably by the time they got to this time frame, uh, they didn't even know why they didn't like the uh, Israelites, but they just didn't like them. <laughs> and that's true to even today, because you know what that nation is today. It's the Arabs. And it's basically all the Muslims in the Muslim world. Okay, just a few things on this in verse 14. I'll read it again. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith the, thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. So under the king of Edom, I want to read, read in Judges 11, 16, and 17 about these Edomites. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness under the Red Sea, they came to Kadesh. And Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom. Now this is in Judges, saying, let me, I pray thee, pass through the land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. 
So force them to, to stay in Kandesh until they could uh, attempt another uh, way around uh, Edom. I think this also kind of, uh, again, block, continued them in the desert area until God was ready to lift the permission to go into the promised land. So Moses will attempt to reason with them. Uh, but uh, now jumping down to verse 16 of Numbers 20. We, and when we cried unto the Lord, we, he heard our voice and sent an angel and has brought us forth out of Egypt. Behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the utmost of thy border. So here Moses is still trying to convince the, uh, the uh, king of Edom to allow him to come through. I just want to take a quick minute here, too. This is why I brought this up. Uh, this word angel, uh, you see here, sent an angel that brought us forth out of Egypt. Angels can have different meanings because all the word really means is messenger. You notice it's got a little A here, so it's not a proper name, but a, uh, but a, uh, a general term. So here, messenger is used of God, of men, and of an order of created spiritual being, beings whose chief attributes are strength and wisdom. But in this case, a man, the word angel, messenger, is used by men. Uh, I guess list a few examples where uh, angel can actually mean a man. Uh, it even, even talks about it can mean a pastor. It can be a reference to a pastor because he is a messenger. He's bringing a message. So, so here's a few examples of Luke 7.24. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? So this, that word messenger there is the same word of angel that's used by as angel in other places, as angels. Also James 2.25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers, there it is again, same word as angel in other places, and had sent them out another way. And so as pastors, it's also mentioned in Revelation quite a few times. In Revelation 1, verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So again, a reference to the pastor of those churches. Jump into chapter 2, verse 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith, he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So it says, under the angel of the church of Ephesus. Jump into verse 8. Again, and under the angel of the church in Smyrna. Jump into verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? Under, in chapter 3, verses 1. Under the angel of the church of Sardis, right? Verse 7. Under the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? And verse 14. And under the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? These things which the men, which saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, beginning of the creation of God. So I just wanted to show that correlation, a little difference between uh, angel as you see it in the uh, having to do with a, uh, a being that God created that's, that resides in heaven. There's also fallen angels. And of course, when it's used as a messenger. Okay. And verse 21. Thus, Edom refused to give Israel passage to his border. Wherefore, Israel turned away from him. So Edom's judgment is sealed by God at the future day in the tribulation. Just a couple of verses on uh, verse 21 here. Edom's judgment. Psalms 137, verse 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who say, raise it, raise it, even into the foundation thereof. Raise it, raise it as a way of destroy them, destroy them. Kind of like saying that. Also in Ezekiel 25, 12 through 14. 
Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended, for he vengeth himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it a desolation from Telme, uh, of the, and, of, and they of the Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my Lord, by, I, by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall go and eat them according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. So, and also the, the whole book of Obadiah, I'm just going to mention a few verses, verses 10 through 15. There's only one chapter in it. For the violence against thy brother Jacob, shame I shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. When God says forever, that means forever. And the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive his purse, and the, and the foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou should not have looked on that day of thy brother in, in that day, and he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have been rejoicing over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. These are, this is basically all prophecy against this people group. Thou should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. They should have not looked on the affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither should thou have stood in the crossways to cut those, cut off those of his that did escape, and neither should thou have delivered up those of his, of his that did remain in the day of distress. I think that might be referring to the tribulation, when the uh, at the midpoint when the people leaving Israel head for Petra. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done it, shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. So you can see he mentions here the day of the Lord. That's the tribulation uh, and the end of the, towards the end of the tribulation. So Edom is still going to get their just rewards for for the for denying their brother and not and not helping out in this in this case here in uh, uh, this passage we're studying. Okay, last but not least, well actually I'm already over thirty minutes. I think I'm going to keep. I was going to do Aaron's death. But uh, I will wait and do this portion. It's actually not that long. We just finish it up. We're 32 minutes. Uh, so it'll take less than five minutes. So I'll just read through this last portion. And it talks about Aaron and, and, the, and, the, and Mount Hor. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, but he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because you have rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son and bring them up unto Mount Hor. And strip Aaron of his garments and put them upon Eleazar his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up into the Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount, and Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron thirty days, even all the house of Israel. So, because this ends, this uh, this is actually the end, Aaron's death of the 40 years of wandering. So, at this point, uh, they're free to start to enter into the promised land again. So, here's a definite marker indicating the end of the 38 years uh, Israel had been sentenced to the wilderness. And we, we know this because we read in uh, Numbers 33, 38. And Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month. So you see it says the 40th year. It tells us Aaron died there in the 40th year. 
So there is very little record of what happened during these years. They are compressed into five and one half chapters, while the single year at Mount Sinai is given almost 50 cha chapters. That's in uh, Exodus. So this was to demonstrate, I mean Leviticus, this was to demonstrate these years accomplished nothing except the death of the generation of unbelief. Those were just years of surviving in the desert, wasted years, waiting for the old man to die. So during these 38 years, there was much movement, but no progress. Our walk with God could be the same way. Uh, if you're somebody that just uh, spends his time going to church and not really, not really doing anything for the Lord, not seeking to find out what the Lord has for you to do, you can almost look at that the same way. What have you really accomplished? What have you done uh, to uh, further the, uh, uh, the mission of the church, of, the, of Jesus? So moving also to a few comments on verse 26. Let me reread it. And, and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on Eliezer. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people and shall die there. So God gave special warning about Aaron's death. So a smooth and graceful transition could be made in passing down the position of high priest to Aaron's oldest living son, Eleazar. So the man dies, but the priesthood does not die. Uh, it continues on. And the access and relationship with God it describes carries on. Noah's relationship with God in Israel was to depend on Aaron, but on the high priest, whoever he was. God has ensured there will always be a high priest for us to come to in Jesus. So Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, let's look at that. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. But we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all ways tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to him in time of need. And we, need not be, uh, and we need not depend on any man for our relationship with God. Amen to that. Okay, moving to verse 28. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son, and Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. So the passing of Aaron. This was a huge landmark in the history of Israel. He was the first high priest of the nation and yet not exempt from the decree that his generation would perish in the wilderness. Aaron died as a, as a great but complex figure, more so than Miriam. Uh, let's look at his life as a high priest. And I'm just going to do a little list here, kind of like a review of uh, Aaron and, his, uh, and uh, what he accomplished and didn't accomplish. So he was used of God mightily as Moses' partner. We saw that in Exodus. We, he initiated the priesthood. We saw that in Leviticus 8. We pleaded with Moses for the people. That was in Numbers 16 and 17. But as a man, the debacle of the golden calf, Exodus 32. So that, so as uh, his fleshly uh, human uh, body uh, had some negatives too. And challenged Moses' authority with his sister Miriam. And that was in Numbers 12. That's when Miriam got leprosy. But Aaron went, around, went along with that. He was also complaining to uh, Moses about the, the choice of his wife. So Aaron's life shows us, among other things, that the office is more important than the man himself. I've always said that, too, about our own president. It's not the man we respect when it comes to the presidency. It's the position. Same idea here with the high priest. Aaron, the man, was not always worthy of respect. But Aaron, the high priest, always was worthy of high, of high honor. And Moses, who represented the law. So the, let's take a look at the, these three individuals. I'm not going to get into the promised land. Moses, who represented the law, could not lead them into the promised land. Miriam, who represented the prophets, could not lead them into the promised land. Aaron, who represents the priests, could not lead them into the promised land. Only Joshua. Joshua, that is Jesus. Joshua actually means Jesus could lead them into the land of God's promise. That's uh, a great analogy. And uh, we'll continue going on because we've still got things to do in uh, Numbers and, and, and Deuteronomy uh, before we actually get into moving into the uh, promised land. But uh, that'll be more a lot of review 
and also uh, some sermons by Moses before his time is up. We still got Moses. Moses hasn't died yet, and we're still stuck in Kadesh Barnea. So next we're going to talk about how they're going to get across. They're actually going to go around Edom. That's basically what you see here. That's how they're going to maneuver and head up the, uh, this, this is known as the King's Highway, and it's the most popular route to get up there. Which almost everyone uses this route. Here it is here, going through Bosnia. It's there to this day, it's a highway today. Uh, it's a road, regular paved road. Uh, so that's all I got for today. And I uh, went about 10 minutes over. But uh, great lesson, great chapter. And we'll move into chapter uh, 21 tomorrow. So let's pray. Well, thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity to study your word. And thank you, Lord, and help me, Lord, always to do it in an honoring way that uh, that when I speak that I've done, I'm doing it in, in an honoring way to you, Lord. And we give you praise and thanks in all you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.